Berlin, Germany's capital, and probably also the uncrowned capital of construction sites. But one world-famous architect has been involved in some very important projects. Hi everyone and welcome to this very special edition of Euromax coming to you from the heart of Berlin. Today we are featuring one of the world's leading architects, Sir David Chipperfield. So let's go inside and meet him. And here he is, David Chipperfield. Thank you so much for having us today. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. And you've also helped us put together today's program, so we thank you for that as well. It's fun. Okay, first, um, we know Berlin is a base for you. Uh, I, can't, I can't help but asking, how's your German? Terrible, yeah, Why? unfortunately. After so many years. Well, everyone here speaks English as well. I mean, you try and speak, try and use it in the shop, and everyone just replies to you in English. Yeah, especially right here in the center yeah, of Berlin. Berlin is, Berlin is a bubble from that point of view. It is. Yeah. It absolutely is. Okay, let's um, talk about your career path, how you chose architecture. I mean, for you, was there a eureka moment, a defining moment, or uh, did architecture choose you? No, I grew up in the far in the country. I mean, I grew up on a farm, and um, I think my first. Uh, passion was to be with animals and to be a vet or something like that. But, mm -hmm. um, my father also bought some buildings and renovated them and I worked on those with him. And, um, so I, I don't know, I sort of became interested in, in uh, architecture and I, I wasn't great at school, but I had a really good art teacher, really, you know, one of those teachers that, you know, we all dream of that, mm -hmm. you know, is, um, Inspired you. Uh, inspires you and looks after you and, and I, you know, and I was quite good in the, the art room and I sort of hid a little bit in the art room. It was my sanctuary. And I think he was very, he was very important in sort of encouraging me. Now, um, I'd say it's quite an encouragement. You have offices pretty much all over the world. You have one here, London, Milan, Shanghai, uh, some 300 staff dozens of projects every year. How much of the, the job, um, especially as an architect and designing things, how much is in your hands and how much do you delegate to other people? Um, I delegate an enormous amount. Um, you know, I think uh, architecture is, is not a, a singular activity, certainly not now if it ever was. I mean, the, the image of the, you know, the creative artist uh, staying up at night with a bottle of whiskey and a, <coughs> and drawing, you know, um, I don't think that exists anymore. I think um, the world, you know, the, the nature of our projects, the nature of how we work is highly collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, designing buildings is one thing, designing a structure, designing an office is, is nearly more important. You know, how do you create um, an environment, mm -hmm. a creative environment with, within which people can flourish and take responsibilities. And at the same time, you know, how do, how do you hold the bits together? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, it's important that we have a, an approach, an attitude. So that's my responsibility is to sort of, you know, okay. from my farming background, I suppose, you know, keeping all the animals in the field, stopping okay. them All right, we'll hold off. that thought. We want to take a closer look at some of your lifetime achievements. David Chipperfield is no doubt one of the world's most esteemed architects. Let's take a look at some of his work so far. Berlin's Neue National Gallery by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. It's a shining example of modernist design. Now it's covered over for renovations. David Chipperfield's architectural firm is in charge. Ideally, uh, if we do our work well, you will not know that we've done anything. The Neue National Gallery was opened in 1968. Auf die Architekten. Now, 50 years later, Mies van der Rohe's grandson joins David Chipperfield for the Tradesman's Building Party. He'll be serving as a consultant during the renovation. Chipperfield hasn't become known so much for restoring the old landmark buildings to their original condition. 
more for incorporating the history, the life story of the building, and bringing it out. David Chipperfield's constantly on the go between his four offices around Europe and in Shanghai. He studied in London and started his own architectural firm in 1985. His restoration of Berlin's Neues Museum brought his international breakthrough. After 10 years of construction work, the Neues Museum was reopened in 2009. David Chipperfield has also created entirely new museums, like the Hepworth Wakefield Gallery in England and the Humex Museum in Mexico City. His timeless architecture, as in Baden-Württemberg's Carmen Wirt Forum, is simple, straightforward, open and unobtrusive. This cemetery chapel in Ingagawa, Japan, blends elegantly into its natural surroundings. David Chipperfield has been knighted and bestowed with many accolades, the Mies van der Rohe Award among them. In 2012, he curated the Venice Biennale of Architecture. In 2013, he was awarded the prestigious Premium Imperiale. For its 250th birthday last May, London's Royal Academy of Arts got an overhaul from David Chipperfield, including a new second entrance and new rooms that restructured the interior. And now it has an auditorium as well. One of the reasons he was appointed was the enormous success of the uh, Neues Museum in, in Berlin, which I remember doing the trip with David and we appointed him, he was completely the right figure, partly because he's held in great esteem by his fellow academician architects here, but also that he has this very light touch that enables you to combine the contemporary and the, um, and the historic. This year, David Chipperfield's firm also completed a number of new buildings, such as the headquarters of a cosmetics company in South Korea. Berlin's Neue National Gallery is completely gutted for now, but in the end, the architect's signature will hardly be recognisable. It may well just be an instance of British understatement. David Chipperfield's Berlin office is a modern complex, a comfortable atmosphere for his employees. So here we are in your Berlin office. Um, you've been here since 1997. Why Berlin? Uh, very simple, we won a competition for the re restoration, reconstruction of the Neues Museum. Um, this was a super complicated project, both uh, technically, programmatically, politically, even socially. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it was a project which you could not do at distance. I mean, it was a project that we really had to be on the ground. In mm -hmm. fact, the office began with uh, a small cabin on the site outside of the building. So how has Berlin developed architecturally since you first arrived? The biggest change is, I would say, in, in recent years is the, um, the increased value of the city and the fact that um, the rest of the world has, much to the surprise of the Berliners, have decided that you know, Berlin is a place to be and, and uh, people have moved here. Um, in the beginning, it was not huge investments and, and I would say Interesting, the city changed a lot because it's a place where young people wanted to come. Mm -hmm. But now what's happening is investments coming. Right. Now, you're British, and we know that the UK is in intense negotiations right now over leaving the EU. How does Brexit affect you personally? Um, well, let's start from a professional point of view. I'm not sure. I mean, we have offices here and we have offices mm -hmm. in Milan, so we could say, we could pretend that it's not such a big issue. Um, on the ground, uh, it is a problem because we have a lot of EU nationals in our London office, nearly 50%. I think um, the way that they've been treated is, is terrible. Um, and I would say, personally, uh, it's demoralizing. I think mm. that uh, it's, uh, you wake up every morning wishing it was a bad dream. And uh, we should, it's a very negative, you feel like you're, you're, you've gone into reverse gear, mm. you know, I mean, uh, you know, I was born in 1953. Somehow you always had the feeling that things progressed. Right. And now you have the feeling that Brexit is 
a sort of dead end. Right. So on the flip side of that, back in Berlin, which is definitely progressing <coughs> moving forward, your buildings can be found throughout the city. How do you approach these projects that are so deeply rooted in German history? Well, I suppose Neues Museum was, was, our, was our lesson, was, mm -hmm. you know, was our grounding in this discussion, and we couldn't have had a, you know, a, a more profound you know, being thrown into the deep end of this discussion. But I think, it, I think we embraced, we, I mean, the simple, simple answer is to embrace it and mm -hmm. enjoy it, and, and in a way, the fact that things are so meaningful. Mm -hmm. In Berlin, everything means something. You know, it's a city right. dense with history, and uh, you know, the, the, the anecdote is, of course, that uh, all cities have history, and Berlin has too much. Um, <laughs> and, and of course, that's something which uh, we try to integrate into our considerations. All right, well, we want to take a closer look at the indelible mark that you have left on Berlin's famous museum island. Five major museums are crowded onto Berlin's so-called Museum Island in the River Spree. They are the Alters Museum, which houses the collection of classical antiquities, the Alte National Galerie, showcasing 19th century art, the Neues Museum, which counts the bust of Egyptian Queen Nefertiti among its collection, the Pergamon Museum, currently undergoing renovation with its famous Pergamon altar. And the Border Museum, which boasts an impressive collection of sculptures. Each year, more than two million people visit this UNESCO World Heritage Site. We really liked so many museums being in such close proximity to each other here. I visited only twice uh, so far, uh, like one of them was this Pergamon and the other one was the Greek history. I think I like the Greek history more. Germany gather a lot of treasuries from other countries, so it, it will be very interesting to me. The Neues, or New Museum, was heavily damaged in World War II and stood in ruins for many decades. In 2003, the team around British architect David Chipperfield began major restoration work on it, though at first not everyone appreciated his plan to combine historical and modern elements. Today, however, his work is celebrated as an impressive architectural achievement. David Chipperfield started on this project in 1999. His philosophy was to respect the ruin and not cover up the marks left by history. He wanted to restore and carefully preserve this historical building, while sensitively complementing it with modern elements. Chipperfield's architecture firm developed the master plan for the overhaul of Berlin's Museum Island and also drew up plans for Berlin's brand new James Simon Gallery. It's set to open its doors in the summer of 2019 and it's to serve as the entrance building and visitor center for Museum Island. Right now, the five museums are like five friends sitting at one table but with their backs to each other. The James Simon Gallery will link the open spaces and museums with each other. Chipperfield also worked on buildings near Museum Island, such as the Gallery House on the Kupfergraben Canal and the Museum Island Forum on the opposite bank of the River Spree. The British architect has certainly left his mark on Berlin's historical city center. So these are monumental sites on Museum Island. Which project was the most challenging? Both were challenging, obviously, and, and one was working with a, with a ruin. The other was the challenge of building a new building on, a, on a, you know, in a place where the, to bring modern architecture is very difficult. I suppose Noise Museum was, was, was more challenging. It was more complex, and, it, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it was much more in the public view in the mm -hmm. public consciousness um, it was part of a very strong debate and I think it was also more connected with history. Now this, this public debate surrounding the Noise Museum, <clears throat> did it shake your co confidence at all or change your plans? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I think that architects have to um, explain themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's, it's incumbent on us. I mean, I think that sometimes the profession as a sort of sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think because I've always worked in foreign places. I mean, my very first projects were in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, I never felt entitled in a way, yeah. and therefore you, you have to sort of respect the responsibility that you've been given. So as an English or as a foreign architect, it doesn't matter whether I'm English or not, I mean, to, to be given this incredible cultural responsibility uh, is, a, is, a, is a very complex um, you know, thing, and therefore it's not, a, it's not about what you think. Uh, it's about how you can, can gather um, thoughts and ideas and give them shape. And did you have to cut through a lot of red tape, German notorious red tape? Briefly. <laughs> On the whole, I rather like red tape. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I would say Brexit is about getting rid of mm. this red tape because mm -hmm. the, the, the Anglo-Saxon culture thinks that enterprise works better without red tape. But red tape is there for a reason often as well. I mean, right. yeah, maybe there's a few layers too much sometimes, but the principle of red tape is not wrong. So you not only have a pension for Berlin, you also have a, have a, a connection to Galicia in Spain. What draws you to this region? Uh, accidentally, we went there 25 years ago with three small children and have been going there ever since and built a house. And um, I think it's, um, you know, I mean, we always use words in a very crude way, but it's, you know, it's unspoiled, which mm -hmm. of course mm -hmm. one can say that about a lot of places. Um, on the other hand, I would say that there's, a, you know, another terrible world. It's very real. Mm. Um, uh, it's uh, it's a poor area in many ways, but actually it's a very rich area in terms of its um, its landscape, its way of life, um, and I think for us and the family, it's been fantastic to be back into a, uh, you know a non-touristic. I mean, it's right. it's not a touristic area, and therefore to spend your holidays in a let's call it a more real. Mm -hmm. Garden. environment mm -hmm. is, has been uh, important for the children as well. Right. Well, Galicia also uh, has a rich cultural history, so we want to take a closer look at why our guest spends so much time there. The region of Galicia in northwestern Spain is famous mainly for Santiago de Compostela, a destination for pilgrims from all over the world. Breathtaking views, historic sites and rugged coastlines with steep cliffs add up to a Galicia of timeless beauty. Just over 40 kilometres southwest of Santiago de Compostela is the fishing village of Corobedo, with the typically Spanish terraced houses built right up to the bay's edge. One of them, with its vast picture windows, stands out from the rest. British architect David Chipperfield designed and built it about 20 years ago as a vacation getaway. He's been spending his summers here ever since. The townspeople had to get used to the modern style. This was something different. At first people were curious to know what was being built in that little space, but they were quite pleased with the result. I think in particular the seamen who sailed past it actually envied Mr. Chipperfield a little. The village lies inside the dunes of Corobedo Park, one of six natural parks in Galicia. The wetlands and sand dunes provide a habitat for both domestic and migratory bird species. The Rias Baixas are estuaries that cut deep into the coastlines. They shelter Bateos, square rafts made of eucalyptus wood. Around 2,000 of them are anchored in the Ria de Arauza alone. Ropes are hung on them to attract mussels, which grow on them. Alfredo Otero makes his daily rounds on his boat. Growing mussels is a family business and very much a tradition. It's passed on from generation to generation. My grandparents started doing it and handed it on to my parents and uncle. And they handed it on to my cousins and myself. It takes the mussels about a year and a half to reach full size. During that time, the rope with the mussels attached is pulled aboard the boats again and again to pick the mussels off and clean them. Then they're spread to several more ropes with nets. The work is done partly by hand and partly mechanised. 
The machines take on some of the physical work. But the method of working and cultivating the muscles is exactly the same as it has been for 80 years. Alongside farming and fishing, the cultivation of various kinds of mussels remains one of Galicia's economic mainstays. Its development in harmony with the natural habitats and the Galician culture is the primary objective of the Fundación Ria, founded by David Chipperfield in 2016. In addition, we wish to create a place for people and institutions to meet, where the producers, universities and relevant authorities can get together and talk and participate in planning development for the future, for a sustainable development of the region. Along with sustainability, maintaining quality is critical. This aspect is monitored throughout the processing, and the proof is in the taste of a typical Galician mussel dish. These can be had in any number of restaurants along the shores of the Ria de Arauza. Staying within the complex, we continue our conversation in a more relaxed location. So, Spanish mussels, are you a fan? Well, I'm, I'm a fan of the whole ecology of that part of the world, and um, we spend a long time there and, and uh, as you saw from the report about the foundation, you know, I mean, we've, we've become, you know, interested not only, I mean, I was asked to help on the sort of uh, urban planning and, and the sort of architecture, controlling the, helping to control the architectural development, but increasingly we've become involved in the whole environmental issue there. And, and of course, um, the quality of life is, is very much based on on sort of traditional um, farming, fishing, forestry, and and that's become, uh, you know, it's part of the uh, the, the appeal of that area. And well, why is it important to you? Does it have anything to do with your childhood? You said you grew up on a farm. You know, going back to the ecological issues. I mean, it's something. It seems is it something quite personal for you? As architects, we try to to engage with social purpose. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's two things. You know, it's making things. And it's also having, um, yeah, having purpose, trying to serve society in some way. I mean, this is every architect's um, overriding uh, um, drive is to be useful to society right. somehow. And increasingly, it's, it's more and more difficult. And I found myself in Galicia where I can be useful to society in some way. I can bring my expertise. Um, as a sort of privileged outsider, right. you get listened to maybe a bit more than you should be. Um, and, and you can, uh, yeah, you can, you can try to help them protect those things which you think are, are, are important and, and maybe overlooked that, that they overlook. And of course, it is about how we relate to the world, natural world and the built world. Mm -hmm. um, and how we protect things and how we develop things. Now we've talked a lot about the things that you have <coughs> created all this time. Uh, is there anything on the list that you haven't built yet that you'd like to do? Um, I think, you know, we are very much used to building singular buildings. You know, we, are, we, we benefited enormously from building museums, which are in a way, privileged commissions, I would say. Um, as I tried to say before, you know, as, as architects, you're, you're, you're interested in not just the singular building, but in a way, architects, architecture's contribution to society. And that's something we find very much missing, and we'd like to be a bit more involved, I guess, in housing, in mm -hmm. schools, in, in, in things which might contribute more to the fabric of society, right. social fabric, yes. not just physical Absolutely. fabric. So we know you have a lifetime of achievement behind you and you've marked a milestone birthday and with any birthday you get one wish. What's yours? Oh, this is always difficult. I mean, you have personal wishes and professional wishes, but I suppose if I stood back, um, these rather complicated uh, days, I would say, first of all, my wish would be that Brexit never happens. Mm -hmm. And I suppose if I'm allowed two bites at that, I would say that Trump will resign. Okay, well, 
Those are two wishes. We'll see what happens if, any, if that comes true. All right. Sir David Timberfield, we thank you so much for having us today here in one of your bases in Berlin and for putting the show together with us. Thank you very much. And with that, we have come to the end of the show. From me and the rest of the crew here in Berlin and from Sir David Chipperfield, we thank you for tuning in. And you can always keep up on the show on all of our social media pages. We'll see you again soon. Goodbye.